Oddly enough, um, I was uh, on the staff of UCLA uh, back in the 60s, and I gave the first class at UCLA because one of my jobs at UCLA was to develop the curriculum for the uh, new students coming aboard and also the dental school itself. And so I, I was um, fortunate to, begin, uh, to give the first lecture on mercury fillings that the students had. And in my research, I uncovered that mercury was a concern. In fact, in 19, uh, 1848, it was uh, considered illegal to use mercury, unethical. Uh, the then union of, of uh, dentistry was the American College of Dental Surgeons, and it was like the analogous to the ADA. And that group of bodies said it was illegal or unethical to use mercury because of its toxic concerns. But then there was no alternative that, that was able to be used. So dentists got together and began using mercury fillings because it was more economical. And indeed, there was a serious problem because what are you going to use? You can't use gold. Most people couldn't afford gold. And even the gold techniques were not refined as they are today. So there was no option, no uh, alternative. Uh, so the, this group of dentists began to use mercury fillings, and that group grew and became the American Dental Association. So the American Dental Association has had its formation on the utilization of mercury fillings, which is ironic, of course. A body of evidence that would say, hey, you're, you're using this potentially lethal material while dentists were were teaching, and I was one of the ones who were taught, who then taught that mercury was inert when you mixed with silver, tin, zinc, and copper, of which consists of the mercury filling or the amalgam or the silver filling. It's really a mercury filling because 50% of it's mercury. And if you mix it with silver, tin, zinc, and copper, we taught that it was inert, which is a scientific impossibility because everything by the laws of entropy is in the process of decay. And in the case of the dental mercury filling, the decay is quite, uh, quite prominent. In fact, in the, in the average mouth, we might find sometimes 26 different metals in the mouth, which again, not only is a biocompatible problem with toxicities, but the electronics. This has been a fascinating field for, for us in the last 15 years we've been doing electronic readings. Uh, by using a, an amp meter, uh, a more sophisticated digital amp meter. Well, if we have teeth now that have metal in their mouth that are constantly generating electricity. And by the way, our car battery is a lead pole and a zinc pole and a box of sulfuric acid, right? If we wanted to create the quintessential battery, we would use gold and silver, the cathode and the anode, the positive and the negative pole, which can create a wonderful battery. Well, we do this in the mouth. So tremendous amounts of electricity can disturb the normal flow of ionic flow in the body. So if you've got a constant flow of electricity created by the metal fillings in our, in our mouth, we can then turn off or the body says, hey, the stimulation is constant. I better do something to adapt. So it blocks instead of stimulates like the initial acupuncture needle is stimulated, but if left in there, it could cause a problem. Our teeth are those bioelectrical electrodes, and I refer to them sometimes as spark plugs, because they have capacity. The, the tooth, inst incidentally, the tooth is a very interesting device because it's surrounded by crystal. And the crystal, if we look at what the computer is all about, the computer has its heart in the silicone chip. It has the crystal of the silicone chip. And the analogous of the silicone chip in the computer is the enamel that covers this, this thing we call the tooth. So the, in a normal healthy tooth, the tooth has capacity to hold a charge, like the spark plug has a capacity to hold a charge. But if you put metal in that tooth, you disturb this electronic flow. And so a whole vast of things are now being looked at related to this electrical disturbance that you, that you make mention of, and rightly so. Well, we're, you know, we're, we're talking in general today about controversial subjects, right? And certainly root canal fillings are extreme controversy. And uh, there's been a lot of concerns about the root canal. They're all, and it's not just recent. Uh, Dr. Alfred Price uh, really was one of the pioneers in the concern 
of root canals. He was a past president of the American Dental Association and a tremendous researcher and a humanitarian and a, a, a nutritionist. Um, he said that basically what he had found in his early studies is that he would take an extracted root canal tooth and take some of that grindings and put it underneath the rabbit's ear and he would find that that if the patient, the donor from that tooth, let's say had a strept bacteria, that patient, that rabbit then would mimic or would develop the same kind of infection. So he found that there was bacteria present uh, in a dead tooth living in the tubules themselves. A, a vital tooth, a healthy vital tooth, uh, is made up of a canal on the inside with various um, blood vessels and nerves radiating inside the chamber of that tooth. And uh, radiating from uh, these, this canal are little tubules, microscopic little tubules in the dentin underneath this cap of enamel, as we mentioned earlier, that <clears throat> little tubules uh, allow the fluid to come in and out of that tooth, balancing the hydrostatic pressure within that chamber so that when there's swelling inside the tooth, we see, a, a, we see a fluid coming out the tooth. Otherwise, we'd have a toothache all the time. So this, uh, this exchange of fluids throughout the tubules in a healthy tooth is there for a reason. When we do a root canal filling, we take out, we take out all the uh, canal, all the dead tissue. In the case of uh, a dead tooth, uh, we were to assume that if a tooth died, we would simply remove the nerves and the blood vessels and the abscess and all the dead tissue that was related to a dead tooth and fill it in with a suitable filling material. Now, assuming that filling material is suitable, Dr. Price showed that within these tubules that were once occupied by fluid, now they have become dehydrated and then they become inhabited by microorganisms.